So Great. welcome, right. Mike. Thank you, David. I appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody joining in on this webinar. Um, just a little bit about my background. Um, I have a little over uh, 19 years, um, close to 20 years of IT staffing experience. Um, I ran about a $60 million um, IT staffing and workforce solutions uh, company. Um, there in 2009, I left and started Chartered Path, and Chartered Path focuses primarily in working with investors, executives, and line-level management to drive, uh, to drive growth and profitability within staffing organizations. Uh, much of the work that we do is working with uh, staffing companies that are either doing a shift in strategy or have had some type of plateau in their growth strategy and need to and revamp, uh, revamp their strategy and operations. So the topic today, obviously staffing um, being a people-driven uh, industry, um, retaining top producers is absolutely a, you know, a paramount uh, priority. Right? It's, uh, even though our, our industry has been driven more and more by data with VMS and everything else, the real differentiator is our people and how we manage our people, how we lead our people, and you know, what, is management's, what is management's role in order to do that. Um, I know personally in managing top producers um, that it's easy to get focused on one individual and try to change as much as we can to keep single individuals. I think what you're going to see in this presentation, that as management, it's our obligation to have a more strategic view of retention. And so um, to really control the talent that comes into the organization, to really be able to forecast um, turnover that is unavoidable, and to be able to mitigate any of those impacts that may occur. So you're going to see, a, a, really from a management's perspective, what we can do to, to retain our top producers. So in terms of the agenda, the first thing I really want to talk about is the challenges the challenges of retention um, within the industry. Um, obviously, staffing is um, a ent very entrepreneurial, uh, relatively flat type of industry. There's not a lot of promotions to be had. It's, um, it's highly stressful. It's a performance-driven um, industry, um, and it's a people-driven industry. So there's a lot of unique challenges that staffing organizations face. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of retention, then we're going to talk a little bit about the triggers to turnover. And um, the, the reason I wanted to bring that up is that some of the things that really drive turnover, in my experience, and working with over 60 organizations right now, are kind of unexpected. That uh, even the organizations that are growing rapidly have significant challenges in retaining uh, top producers, and because it's driving change. So we're going to talk a little bit what, what are the common triggers that I've seen in the past that have caused dissatisfaction and turnover, and some of them, some of them will probably surprise you. Um, and then we're going to wrap up, of course, as best practices uh, that improve retention. So what can management really do? You know, what's in management's control uh, to really drive uh, retention within, the, within their organization? And what can't they control, right? What are some things that... You know, sometimes people are going to leave, and there's there's really not a lot that we can do about it. All we can plan for, all we can really manage and mitigate is the impact of those people of those people leaving. So uh, let's go ahead and dive right in here, and uh, and and I want to talk a little bit about the kind of the considerations or the lens I want you to look at this presentation on. The first is that um, you know really turnover is an and is an inevitability. Um, they're, they're the reasons that some people will leave, really you don't have any control over. There are some things that you just can't do. and You can't turn your organization you know, upside down to try to, to try to retain people. At some point, all you can do is build a robust organization that knows how to bring in talent, knows to do the best possible you can in terms of retaining the people that you can retain, but at some, at some point, people are going to leave because there are, there are matters simply outside of our control in order to do that. Secondly, it's very, very important to look at retention as a strategic issue. And what I mean by strategic is I mean it's, it's, more, uh, more, it's, it's, it's not just about compensation. It's not just about the relationships. It's not just about the environment. It's not, it's not about salary or commission. It's, it's a lot of different factors that really drive retention. And some things that are going to retain some people are going to drive other people away. And so there are choices that we have to make as managers in terms of what type of organization do we really want. And so then when people come in, we know what type of people fit within that environment and are less likely to turn over because it's the fact of the matter is, is you can't be everything to everybody. That at some point your, your organization needs an identity that certain people will excel in, certain people will love, but by that very nature, by the very fact that you decided to build a company a certain way, it's simply not going to be a fit for others. 
And with all the companies that I've worked with, I remember when I started doing what I was doing, um, you know, my, my initial thought was that, oh, well, I got to have a, you know, a kind of a turnkey solution for people in terms of, you know, culture and in terms of, you know, how they manage sales and recruiting. And that was quickly blown up because the fact of the matter is, is that successful staffing organizations are, they're all successful for different reasons. And a lot of those things aren't repeatable. A lot of those things are unique to the culture of the organization and to the leadership of the organization. So it's critical that you look at retention as part of the, of the company identity, part of your strategy, and say, this is our identity. These are the types of people that we want, with the understanding that others are not going to necessarily fit into that vision. Then the third is the, you know, the foundation of everything here is, is effective management, is the development of the management team and making sure the managers are, are not only disciplined in terms of how they manage the organization and how they drive efficiencies and make and allow their people to be successful, but also how they identify their talent, how they connect with their talent to make people want to work there. Um, this is a very, you know, when, especially with young managers, you know, these are, there's a lot of different challenges that come in, but, you know, young managers a lot of time come from production, and they, they come in with very, very little training, and so to try to make that transition from peer to manager, for example, is a very awkward one that has a, a significant impact on the people's experience that work for the organization. So if you look at that manager, the managers, especially line-level managers, are the linchpin to the culture. They're the folks that basically allow the standards to be held in place, allow the culture to be strong and consistent, where people feel comfortable and people feel part of a productive team. So when we're talking about these things, these are some of the key considerations that I really want you to keep in mind as we go, as we go, through, the, as we go through this presentation. So let's talk a little bit about the challenges of retention. And what's what's interesting here is, you know, when we talk about the challenges, the first is really the the, the identification of top producers. And you know, the next slide we're going to talk a little bit about traditional ways in which people identify top producers. But I, part of my argument is that some of the ways that we measure this actually close our mind off to the potential producers of the future. Um, so how we identify the top producers as managers is really key and can actually incorporate more art than science, right? Like, yes, metrics will tell you certain things. They tell you about behavior and everything else. But to see the next, the next great employee, the next great salesperson, um, it's, not, it's, it's numbers, but it's also kind of an intuition that, wow, this person, this person is special. This person is going to be a future, a future star. Um, the other is, you know, understanding motivations of our employees. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that what makes this so difficult and what makes staffing actually kind of fun is the fact that we are, that the dynamics are very unpredictable. We're dealing with motivations, both personal and professional motivations that vary from person to person. And, um, you know, understanding what motivates individuals and also understanding how a, how a culture can help really shore up those motivations and align those motivations is absolutely critical um, in understanding and retaining employees. Because if once, once you are disconnected from a person's motivations, once they don't link their motivations to the future of the company, then you either have an employee that's working just hard enough not to get fired, or you're working with, you're looking at, you have an employee that is, you know, just happy in not being a top performer, or you're looking at somebody that's just basically, you know, will only be there for a short period of time and will eventually leave the organization. And the other thing is being comfortable with good and bad turnover. And, uh, and this is a little counter counterintuitive in some ways. Is we obviously, if we have underperforming individuals, you know, turnover is not an issue. But there are some cases where a top producer, um, in one point in time, a top producer at one point in time, can actually be a detriment to the to the organization moving forward. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. That sometimes sometimes less is more. And sometimes even the people that bring in the most gross margin uh, can actually be so disruptive to the culture and force management to make so many changes to try to, um, to, try to meet that individual's needs that they actually have a net negative impact on the, on the long-term growth, uh, long growth of the organization. So these are some of the common things that people are used to kind of to stack rate their producers. And I mean, they're all, I'm sure most of the people you know, on the call have seen these things. Um, and, you know, they're obviously, I definitely recommend knowing this information. I'm not saying this information is not helpful or you know, won't give you any kind of insight. 
What I'm telling you though is that one of the things that I've noticed and whenever I roll out management systems is that it's, metrics have two sides to them when we measure things. Um, one, of, one of the things that it can do if we don't look at them properly, it can actually limit our perspective on how we need to manage the business. So for example, when we're looking at something like this, like total hours or gross profit or ROI, and we're only looking at the people at the very, very top, and if we don't take into account the other considerations, we actually could be turning our, turning our backs on what, who the true, true future top producers could be. So while this is a good way to look back to kind of see, okay, who's performed in the past, it doesn't tell you anything in terms of who's really the future of the company. And when you talk about management, management is 80% about the future, right? Your, your producers are there focusing on today and everything else, but your, the management's there to, to constantly improve the organization, to constantly make it ready, make it more competitive for the future. That's the management's job. So looking at the ROI report is good and it's informative. However, it doesn't necessarily provide a lot of insight in terms of who in the future is really going to be moving the company forward, who's going to be growing the organization. And identifying those people and developing those people require much more engaged and active, and active management. So when we talk about proper identification of top producers, um, and I'm going to use a you know, personal story here because this is my own mistake you know, that I made, is that um, I would always look at my ROI report. I would always look at it and say, oh, this person is the top producer, and not worry about that individual and assume that individual is okay. But one thing that I realized is that you know, that person was being successful primarily because of the dynamics at a very specific account with a very specific group that had a lot of business, and that person was very plugged into that. But her success was was contingent on that unique environment, that unique situation, that unique circumstance. And so and every time you know she would win an award or every time we'd say she was the top salesperson, we never kept her grounded to say, you know what, it's great that you're in this situation. It's great that you have this business coming in, but the rules still apply. Every single book of business eventually goes away. And eventually you're going to have to rebuild. And so we did her a disservice because we didn't really appreciate the circumstances of why she was that top producer. On the flip side of it as well, if you have hunters, the people that are basically driving the future of your organization, most a lot of hunters are going to be in the middle to bottom part of your um, you know, of your gross margin report in a lot of cases because they're dealing with the immature business, right? Growth within a staffing organization primarily in most cases, right, there's exceptions to everything, but in most cases, growth is driven by account penetration, right? That's where you see it. And, you know, it's typical account managers and things like that that drive that growth. But the future of the organization, you know, whether the company's going to grow two or three years from now is really built on the work that your hunters are doing, the people that are doing the business development. And an ROI report is a, is a very um, deceptive way to look at that individual's, individual's performance. So understanding the circumstances in terms of whether somebody's a top producer is absolutely critical. So you also have to have, be very proactive in the identification of high, high potential employees that um, I would even argue, you know, when we look at um, the onboarding process and the first 90 days of when we hire somebody, um, keeping an eye and, and, and looking how people are managing their desk and being involved and understanding who are the people that are exceptional, who are the people that are rising to the top, and be able to give those, give those folks um, in, you know, accelerated training and be able to recognize them as the future of the, or, of the organization. And the other thing is, is an honest assessment of your employees' motivations to try to truly understand what, why they work for you. You know, and there's a variety of reasons. We're going to talk about those reasons of why your employees work for you. And there's, there's obviously others that are going to be outside of this presentation. But you really have to be honest with yourself. And the, the reason is, is that if we're not, for example, if we believe that somebody is, um, you know, will stay with our company forever um, because they're loyal to us, but in the end what they're really loyal to is it's more the golden, the golden handcuffs, then we cannot, we cannot predict whether that person's a flight risk or not. Right, so when that account blows up, is that person really going to be prepared to rebuild their book of business, and are you ready to invest in them to re rebuild that book of business, or um, are they going to are they just going to get up and leave? And if you have people that are primarily motivated by by personal loyalty, by personal development, and things like that, and are not connected um, to the culture, they're much 
the, the flight risk for them and the, the ability for them to leave is much higher and your ability to try to change their minds is much more difficult. So those are the three things in terms of proper identification of your top performers. So the question then is that when we talk about the motivations and understanding the motivations of our employees, why do people leave and why do people stay? And it's, it's more than just money, right? Money is obviously important. People rarely leave to t take less money, right? Most, but people will leave, take a cut in their commissions to get a higher base and things like that. But typically it's not compensation. I mean, when I see people leave organizations, whether it's management or whether it's top producers, it's other, it's other things. And so we look at the cultural motivators. And this is huge, especially when you're talking about the younger generation, the kind of the millennial generation or whatever. The, um, the, the, what drives the loyalty a lot softer than it was um, even in my generation, borderline Gen X, you know, baby boom. So it's a, you know, it's a loyalty to leadership. And this is especially true with smaller organizations, less than $10 million, when you have the principle that's highly, highly involved, right? That, that because the organization is relatively small, people, believe, people feel or they do actually have a personal connection with that executive. And that's important to people. Um, and, and in the end, that's a lot of reasons why people stay. The interesting part of that, though, and the kind of the, the, the negative side to that is that as an organization grows, by the very nature, that relationship begins to change between that top executive and the individuals. So the loyalty to leadership is something that you know is it's important to it's important to maintain, especially when you have a, a charismatic uh, a charismatic leader. But it's also something that changes as the company grows. The other cultural motivator is a loyalty to the team, and so when you walk into your environment. You know, is the team dynamic? Is there are there personal relationships that people feel loyalty loyalty to, and do they feel like they're part of a team, part of something special? And then, of course, is it an enjoyable environment? Do they like coming like coming to work? The other side, of, the other types of motivators are more individualized. They're really outside of the, the the dynamic of the office or the dynamic of leadership or anything else. And these are the folks that it's very very difficult to influence whether or not you're going to be able to retain them or not. Um, and the individual motivators, the compensation or the willingness to promote, you know, growth and learning, there is, some, there is something that you can do there. But really, most of those things, you can't substantially change unless you're going to, uh, without the threat of really disrupting your entire organization. So you're not necessarily, when you think about it, for example, if somebody wants a higher salary and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to do this because I want to keep them. Not I'm going to do it because this is how we promote people, not this is our this is how we do salary increases, but you do it because somebody says they're going to leave. Um, well then you've set the precedent that, you know, the only way to get a raise within the organization is to threaten to leave. And so it really restricts you. And as you get larger and larger and larger, these exceptions really start becoming more and more difficult uh, difficult to manage. And honestly, even when there is a change in compensation, those people are still a flight risk. Um, it's a temporary band-aid, which might be necessary to kind of tap things down. But strategically and long term, I think management needs to look at this and say, you know, this person could still remain a flight risk. The other one is obviously being promoted. And this was kind of my thing when I was a recruiter back, gosh, in 94. Um, I, I was fine with recruiting. It was okay. You know, but I, I got, after a couple of years, I just got antsy. I got bored. I wanted to do something else. And so um, the organization I work with said, okay, great, you go open up offices. So I went up and, and opened up offices, and that was enough to keep me entertained for a while. And then they brought me back, and I was regional. So there was always, there was always something different for me to do, and that was incredibly important to me. But the only way for that to happen is if the company is really growing. right? They were, they were not going to just make up roles you know, for me. And so because staffing is a relatively flat organization, somebody might be asking for a promotion. And the problem that I've seen occur is that people will give them a promotion even if the company needs, doesn't really even need that role. So I'm going to make you a regional manager. I'm going to do this. And that puts, a very, it puts the organization in a very difficult spot. And then, of course, in terms of growth, growth and learning, and this is something that you do have a better control over. Um, you know, you can send people to different certifications. You know, SIA has certification, ASA has certification, TechServe has certification. You know, things like that. But typically, you know, growth and learning and promotion kind of go hand in hand because, in the end, the person that's motivated by growth and learning is eventually going to want a new day-to-day -day challenge. That just learning isn't going to be enough. They they need to be able to apply that learning. So if you look at the cultural motivations versus individual motivators, 
you have much more control over the cultural motivators than you do the individual ones. So when you're assessing your, in, your individual producers and making these sounds like, that person, is that person really going to be a long-term play for me or not? That's an honest assessment that you have to make and should determine how you respond, uh, respond to that individual. So how do, how do motivations and turnover kind of play and play, come into play? So people leave when their motivations are not fulfilled by the organization. So when I was talking, when I was talking earlier, it was like you have to kind of choose or you do have to choose what type of organization you are and what type of people fit best within your organization. And it's going to line up that those people's motivators should be, fairly, should be the same. You know, they should be, there should be a lot of consistency among them. Um, it's impossible to fulfill all employees' motivations. And... I think that's critical because as managers, we tend to be reactive and people come to us and say, I want this, I want to do this, I want to do this, and we try to fix it. Um, but if we did that, then our organization would be simply a, a kind of a mosaic of different, uh, different people trying to get the, what, they, what they want versus what's best within, within the organization. And any attempt to kind of try to do that creates an incredibly chaotic business environment. And people don't really know what is direction is this organization actually going, and and you know what what's my part in this organization? All those things are kind of confused now because we're not being consistent. So in the end, when you look at top producers and retaining top producers, I guess what I'm telling you is this: first and foremost, understand that the organization has to really come first. The long-term health of the organization needs needs to come first, and to understand that at a, at a top performer. You need to look at a top performer not just based on the talent that they have or the business that they bring in, but their true long-term investment within the organization. And it's okay that there are some people that might want to move on, but you have to be honest with yourself that that might happen, and your job as manager is just to say, you know what, I understand there's only really so much I can do. It's your job as a manager to make sure that you have a proper backfill and, the, and you can mitigate the impact of that. And that's really what I mean in terms of when I talk about retention is strategic. As managers, that's what I mean, to understand what you can control, what you can't control, and, and, and actually have a plan in place for the inevitable turnover that might occur within your organization. So now, so now we've talked a little bit about, you know, the, you know you kind of get in this background. What I want to talk about now is you know, what are the triggers? Like what when a man one of the things about management is we always want to be in front of things. We, we as much as possible. Yes, there's always going to be stuff that we react to. And that's how our typically that's how our days are. But our jobs really as managers is to be prepared for the future, is to be ready to kind of be kind of see ahead to what, what might occur in the future and prepare for it. And um, so when we talk about triggers to turnover this is kind of a, some of these things are going to be counterintuitive, like I mentioned before. But one of, the, one of the things, which is, this is really interesting, is that whenever you have an organization that is going through rapid growth, the people that have been there long term actually are high turnover risk because their relationship with the organization is changing. Their influence is waning. They're losing control. They're losing input um, into the future of the organization. They're becoming more of a this is a terrible term, but I can't think of a better one, more of a cog in the wheel type um, you know, mentality. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm losing influence, so I'm actually backsliding in my career because the company's growing. And that seems counterintuitive, but it actually can occur. There are some folks, obviously, with rapid growth, there are some folks that will be promoted, and internal promotion is absolutely one of the you know the best best ways best ways to grow but only certain people are going to be promoted and those people are that now that are going to be promoted their peers now report to them so now you have people who were you know working for a smaller organization might have had direct access to the executive now not only do they have less access and less influence but they actually report to one of their peers and so now they're dealing with a situation where they've kind of backslid and they feel like they're going backwards in their career. So managing somebody through that transition is incredibly important. Um, the uh, you know, prolonged stagnation or contraction obviously is a huge component of that. Uh, you know, some of that has to do with the, you know, personal motivations, also fear that the company might be going out of business or isn't on the right track. So that's pretty obvious. You know, people are going to leave if, they don't, if, the company's not, if the company's not growing. Account disruption is, a, is another one, especially for salespeople. Um, like I said, you know, mo a lot of top producers, their gross profit is going to be driven by a few accounts. Um, you, know, you see that in a lot of cases. Um, it's management's job to work with that individual to make sure that um, eventually 
that account is going to go away. And we constantly have to remind our people that in this business, everything is temporary. Like, this is good. Maximize your production as much as you can at these accounts. But don't feed into the myth that this is going to last forever because people have a very, very difficult time letting that go. And they will eventually blame the company. They'll be able to say, oh, well, I was successful here and I did this and then this account went away and then my company didn't do anything for me. So the idea is to make sure when we're managing our people doing performance management, it's like we've got to be real with them and we've got to tell them, like, okay, this is good that you're building this, you know, but just be, just be ready that you know, we're going to ride this as long as we can, but eventually this could, this could go away. The other is leadership changes, um, you know, bringing in outside leadership. Um, or even promotions, like I mentioned before, uh, can drive can drive turnover if not properly communicated um, and not properly managed internally within the team. Um, so especially when bringing in new managers, um, we have a tendency when we interview managers and we're talking to managers, it's like, well, tell me what your background is and everything else. But we really need to understand what their management style is, you know, and have also them understand, you know, what. Um, you know how what the culture of the, of the organization is to try to smooth that pathway, you know, smooth that out, so they can actually build those relationships and reduce turnover. There's an excellent book called The First 90 Days um, that I would recommend to anybody who's either hired a new manager or maybe a new manager themselves uh, to look at that because it does give you that perspective of you know first understand and then act. You know don't feel like you have to change everything and you know, and and what do you need to understand in terms of an organization before a new leader new leader comes in. And then obviously another is policy changes. Um, commission plans are a big one, obviously, and properly modeling out commission plans and making sure you understand by individual the financial impact of any compensation change is absolutely crucial. Um, so that can then be communicated and managed to the team. Um, any other you know, vacation or benefits, you know, any of those things can have a significant impact on turnover. How we roll those out and how we communicate those, especially to top producers, is critical. And we talk about change management in a little, you know, later on in the presentation. You know, part of this too is understanding is like if you have exceptional people that they might be producers. Uh, they're not managers, but they're leaders within the organization. Um, any having them engage in the process of change, if they have the business maturity in order to do that, is absolutely crucial because they then not only can you manage them to make sure that they're comfortable with how things are changing, they can also be advocates for them. So any kind of policy changes that are significant, if you have top producers that I say have strong business maturity, engage them early on in the process get their feedback and make them an advocate for those changes. So I, this is a, an attempt here to kind of link the two together, right? So we looked at the cultural motivators, you know, the things that really impact cultural motivators of rapid growth, leadership changes, policy changes, those are things that are just very, 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 very disruptive to the culture um, by nature. And so, you know, these things can change the, how a company is run, how employees actually identify with the organization and, and can and definitely undermine, undermine the overall culture of the organization. Individual motivators are really impacted by, you know, the, the other things I have listed here, like for example, prolonged stagnation. Well, if my, comp, if my compensation is obviously going down because my commissions are being impacted, that is a, that's a that's a personal issue. I also don't have promotions uh, opportunities ahead of me, which is also a personal issue. Um, and then, of course, policy changes kind of cross over cross over to both. So, you know, when we look at change management, all these things are really critical and to take into account. So now we, you know, we know these are the things that kind of um, cause, you know. You know, we know really how to identify top producers. You know, we realize that first off, you know, top producers are just not the people that are bringing the most gross margin. You also have to keep an eye out for the people that are your potential, your future of the organization, your people that are doing the business development, the people, um, the new employees that you think are top producers. You have to take a balanced look at all those folks and make sure that you're very intimately involved on, on who you think really is going to be the future of the organization. Um, we talked about what triggers turnover, what are some business events that actually trigger it. Some of them are fairly predictable like stagnation, Other, others are counterintuitive like growth, for example, but now let's kind of hit, this is where the rubber hits the road here. It's like, okay, so what? Like, 
what do I do as a manager to make a difference, right? And, and all we can do is, is mitigate we can't control. We, we only can mitigate and make things better. But so we got to focus on what we have control over. But what are some of the best practices as, as executives as well as managers that we can do to build a stronger organization and retain the people that, that we want to be part of the long-term growth of the company? So the things that we're going to really talk about here is a strong company identity, and and um, this is, you know, this is something that's kind of come to me over the over the years. Because um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is culture. Obviously, the culture is so like, it's so hard to define. You know, there's like you talk to me, oh yeah, we got a great. What does it mean, right? So this is a kind of an attempt to to really narrow these things down. So each one of these things are cultural in nature. And like I mentioned to you before, culture is really truly what you have control over. Yes, you can tweak somebody's compensation, but that is not your that cannot be your kind of your strategic or your way that you retain people. It has to be really based on cultural things that you're building within the organization to build it strong and to make, and to want people to work there. So the first thing is really a strong company identity. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit in detail um, after we kind of go through this. Consistent one-on-one -on -one management. Um, you know, very really well aligned recognition and incentives and compensation plans are, are, are well aligned. Good, good solid change management and a very strong, very strong collaborative environment. So people in general, and I know I, I was this way and I think millennials are especially, especially like this as well, is they, they want to work for an organization that has a strong identity and that is unique. Like they know why they work there, and they know they know in the context of like, hey, we're better than the competition. We might not be bigger than the competition. We not might not be growing as fast as the competition, but they need to be pointed at something that makes them significantly better than the competition. The reason the reason why you know they 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 are there. The purpose in terms of the marketplace. That the fact is is that these these folks are going to know that. Uh, um, that a client's going to work for them because they do X, Y, Z the best of anybody else within, within the marketplace. The other is, why is the company better to work for, right? So I know that I have a unique way to go about the business. I know why my customers like to work with us. We know why our consultants like to work with us. But the reason I like to work here is because of X, Y, Z. And if I called your employees and asked them what was it, would they be able to say that? It's like this is what's great about the company. This is why I love to work here. And it's some of it's going to be money, but honestly, most of it's not. Whenever I ask that question of why you'd like to work somewhere, very rarely is compensation mentioned. Very, very rarely. It is about the connection with management. It's around confidence and the vision of the organization. That's why people love to work someplace. It's the environment that they work in. And so when you look at is the, is, the, is the company's future compelling, it's like people want to ride on coattails. They want to be on a coattail of a company. It's like, wow, this, this company is going places. And I love working here. I love what we do with our client and the company's moving and shaking. This is where I want to work. So if you ask yourself as management, if you ask your team these questions, would they have an answer to it? And if they don't have an answer to it, then they're not connected to the company, right? And they, that makes them a flight risk. One of the most common things that I hear when, about people, especially top producers who are getting ready to leave, is the relationship with the management team, especially their 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 uh, their direct the manager that they directly report to. And consistent one-on-one -on -one management is absolutely key. So whether or not you do performance review reviews on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, every company is different. I understand that. There's no real rules around that, but do them. Do performance reviews. Um, make sure your people understand what the expectations they are. Make sure that these reviews are interactive in nature, that people come in, that you're having discussions, you're giving coaching, you're, you're busting the myths that this individual might be embracing and concerning their current book of business. You're having honest conversations, right? The other thing is, is that you have well-defined boundaries of the nature of the relationship. So there's, there's going to be some employees that, and it's great, it's, it's great that look, you have a personal connection, you have some kind of hobbies in common or whatever it may be, and it's great to talk about those things, but when it comes, but the other employees cannot see you favoring one person over another because you're simply more comfortable with that individual. The playing field, that playing field of that relationship is flat, that if you do your job and you do it well, then management is going to respect you and management is going to be engaged with you. It's not going to be based on whether there's some kind of personal connection 
or not. And that's a common mistake I see, especially with new managers, you know, when they have friends that they used to work with, and now that they're managing those individuals, that's a very, very difficult transition, and it will push, it will definitely push, push people away. You know, effective um, incentives and recognition. So most, you know, most of the organization's uh, compensation plans are really grilled, built around gross profit. Um, I think that, you know, commission plans, I believe that, you know, you definitely want it around uh, um, a gross profit. But also, there are other elements that you can bake into that and still keep it simple that really take into account that person's individual position. So is it fair that I'm paying uh, the same commission plan to an account manager who is handed a large account and they're managing that gross profit to a business pr to development person who has to hunt and kill every single book, every, every single job or every single job that they bring in, they have to hunt down and get. And when one, when you look at it for the future of the organization, one is so incredibly valuable, and yet this is something I had to struggle with when I had hunters bringing in this business. I had to figure out a way to compensate them and recognize them effectively instead of just keep talking about my account managers who are basically just maintaining or pen penetrating existing accounts. Both are important, but the, the problem is, is that we tend to bury the people that are doing the new business if we just look at the gross margin. Uh, Company-wide reviews and, and, uh, and awards, you know, I think is, is critical. If you guys are doing ops reviews, it's a great way to recognize certain people, to be able to say, you know, this person did a great job here. These are some awards that we have that you kind of fit, that fill in these gaps, but you're constantly communicating the state of the organization, where the organization is headed, who are the key people that have contributed to it, and why they, you know, and you know, and just and really reinforcing why this is a great company to work for, and of course, you know, contests are you know very popular. Whether it's Presidents Club contests or whether it's Leeds contests or whatever, all those things kind of baked in. Um, the effective incentives of recognition really sh allow allow you to kind of shake things up a little bit, um, allow you to kind of make people motivated to go to work in something that can in a in a position or a industry that can that requires a lot of focus and a lot of kind of mundane, repeatable tasks. The other is change management, and our, we live in such a fluid industry, this industry is just so incredibly fluid that we are constantly having to change to be competitive, but you have to make sure that you have a good solid change management plan, especially with large changes. Like I mentioned compensation earlier, there's nothing that will disillusion a, a top producer more than a change that's rolled out poorly. Because the first thing that they're going to say is like, well, why didn't you? T you know, they're going to they might say, well, why didn't you talk to me about this beforehand? Or secondly, God forbid, you missed something, and you roll out a change that's effective, and then you have to roll it back. So those change management, being good at change management, is absolutely crucial to retain your top to retain your top producers. So one of the key things, and and like I mentioned before, you know, taking these top producers and even talking to them about the changes that you're considering and get their buy-in ahead of time, again, depending on their business maturity, is a great way to go about this. But you want to communicate to the team and be honest in why the current state is in, in, insufficient um, and why it's a risk to the organization, why the business reasons, why you're making these changes. And, and then you're going to be able to lay out how the organization is going to look differently and how it's going to benefit them. You, know, you get the buy-in of the key personnel from beginning to end, even after the change is rolled out. A few weeks later, bring them in and say, "How do you think it's going? What do you think? You know, what do you think the team is uh, uh, feeling in terms of these changes that are being made?" Um, you know, you might consider mitigating uh, the impact of certain individuals. So, you know, if you roll out a change and let's say it's a compensation change, and you know that one person is going to be hit so much harder than some other people, but you have to make the change for the long-term health of the company. I mean, some type of bridge or something that allows that person to accept that change is perfectly reasonable, right? But it's just, you know, you have to really understand the impact of each individual as you, as you go through these changes. And, you know, continually update them, you know, your folks on the progress of the change. So one of the things that makes an organization look chaotic and really concerns employees is when we roll out something and then it just kind of dies. It doesn't, there's no momentum behind it. There's no update behind it. And, you know, let's say it's, oh, we're going to really drive mid-market business development and we're going to do this. We're going to have a leads program and everything else. And then it just kind of over three or four, everybody's excited. Then, well, then over three or four weeks, it just slowly dies a slow death. Th those things undermine confidence in management because they're saying, well, you can't lead us. You know, you can't stay focused enough to lead us through this. So, you know, updating them on the progress and staying focused on the progress is absolutely crucial. So a strong collaborative environment, honestly, this is one of the key reasons why people, 
you know, why people stay is because of the people they work with. I mean, obviously the relationship with the manager is absolutely critical, um, but you also want a strong collaborative environment. And when the organizations grow, one of the things that really undermine that in a collaborative environment is this kind of a squishiness in roles and responsibilities. Like you, you might have managers or leaders who's people don't really know what they do or you know, support personnel that don't really know what they do. Um, you might not have the right um, you know, job order, pro and we talk about well-defined processes. You know, as, as an organization grows, how do we manage our job orders? How do we manage submittals? How do we manage coverage? Um, you know, who, does, who does what? Those processes and that maybe have been eventually were maybe manual on a whiteboard are now broken because there's too much data flowing through the organization and things start breaking. I was put in a situation, this is years ago, where great people, just great people, and I walk in and I talk to management and manage like, I think we have to get rid of the team. I think the team is so dysfunctional. We're not going to be able to save this organization. I think we're just going to have to have a lot of turnover and hit the refresh button. But what became clear was that the people were great. There was nothing that, yes, there were a few bad apples that couldn't make the change. But, but primarily what it was is that they didn't know how to work together anymore. They grew so fast. There were so many new people in the offices that the, the workflow was completely broken. And so now people just kind of make things up, and that drives an incredible amount of frustration and mistrust. So, um, you know, having well-defined, well-defined processes, scalable processes, is absolutely crucial, and it drives culture. Believe it or not, uh, culture of productive conflict. Um, the idea that you know, whenever there's an organization that is driven by gossip, it's because people are not don't feel comfortable with productive conflict that they can't actually meet up front and be able to have an actual argument. Right, and then be able to hit the reset button after the argument and move on. Um, so having people be able to have a conflict and move on is absolutely critical. Um, minimal fear and uncertainty. Obviously, this is kind of a the way this business is. There's always some uncertainty associated with it. Um, but you know, you, you want people to feel confident that this is how we do business. This is how I do my business. I'm not going to be reprimanded for doing what I need to do. That we all agree on. This is this is the right team. Uh, this is the right way to do things. And then spontaneous team building is a great indicator. So if you have folks that, not a planned thing like we're going to go, I don't know, uh, we're going to go play golf or whatever, it, not planned by the company, but when, when team members are actually going out for drinks after work or they're doing things after work like that, especially in a young environment, is a great sign of a strong, a strong culture that these kids actually want to be together. They want to, they want to spend time together is a, is a great indicator of that. So in, in kind of wrapping this up, one of the things is retention is incredibly complex. Re retention is strategic. It's not just about that one individual who might leave that you're going to have to replace. That is part, it's a part of your entire organization, that you know what kind of people work well in your organization, you know what kind of people are going to struggle within your organization because you have a, a, a strong identity, you have a strong way to approach the business. And it requires strong, highly engaged management management skills. Um, that includes, like I mentioned before, the identification of of not only today's producers, but who's tomorrow's who are the tomorrow's top producers going to be. Um, a very clear company identity is you know um, strong and consistent performance management. The people know how management engages them. They know how to communicate with management. Um, that there is no daylight between management and employees in terms of a common a common goal. Um, very active change management. Man management knows that they're going through significant changes. They they are communicating those changes effectively. They're getting buy in from those top producers, right? If again, I'm always going to say that if they have the business maturity, that's always going to be you know associated with that. Um, and then a well-run operations that drive collaboration. People know exactly how they need to work together. They're efficient, they're competitive, and they're focused. All those things are the things that you can control as a manager. If somebody, there's going to be people, like I mentioned before, that have personal motivators that they either, you know, they want to get, they want a bigger salary, they want to get paid differently. Um, sometimes that might be necessary to do that if you're, you know, in a unique situation, but. A lot of cases, those people are going to end up leaving. Secondly, they might want to be promoted. They might be bored in their job, and you don't have a role for them, right? Um, and so, or they just want to learn more. They want to experience different things. So those are the things that you can control. The things that I have listed here are things that you can control, and things that you, and, and, and people will leave, but you're going to have a strong 
well-run organization that's going to have a pipeline of top producers coming in to mitigate the risk of those that, that might end up leaving. This is just a brief uh, breakdown of what we do as an organization. So like I said before, um, Charter Path works with management. That's all we do. And we work with executive management. We actually do work in, with investors as well, as well as line level managers to really train them up, to um, ha teach them how to do their jobs more effectively, build management systems that empower them, help them implement new policies, come up with strategies, you know, things like that. And that's, that's, that's what we do. And so that's kind of listed here. So. Um, I don't know, David, if there's any questions, but that's uh, that's pretty much it as far as the presentation. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Mike. Really great information. And um, got a couple of uh, follow-up questions and, and actually just uh, some things I want to ask personally. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier on in the presentation, a question came up, uh, and I'm going to try to paraphrase the best I can, but you talked about sometimes there's top producers who are thirsting for new opportunities, but the firm itself doesn't need the top producer in a new role, so they create opportunities and that disrupts the organization. Yeah. Um, what When you're in a small to mid-sized company and there's not an immediate lateral move available for somebody, and you've got this top producer who needs an opportunity, but nobody waiting in the wings to fill the top producer's shoes, what strategies can a company implement? Right, well, the, I mean, the first thing, and, it, and ideally, this is, a, this is a great question. And you know, a lot of this goes to the play of, of having the early, being highly engaged in performance management up front so you can kind of see those things coming and you have time in order to prepare because time is crucial. Because what you don't want to get to the point is where you have a top producer that's at wit's end and now we have to come up with a solution. So when that person initially brings that up, um, the fact of the matter is, is that you you have to be able to say, you have to be able to pipeline for those individuals, go ahead and even over hire temporarily to try to find somebody to be able to fit into that role. A lot of times you can find, you can craft a, a role for that individual that is beneficial to the company um, as, as, and that, that can retain them um, as well as beneficial to them. But the key is, is when you have those when you have those meetings is to have honest communication with that individual and say look this is what this is realistically what we can do and then put it back on them and say this is what you need this is what needs to happen on your end and for it to occur so if you have a salesperson that says look i want to be able to do x i don't know move into management or do whatever let's say that's the example well then the first thing would be that person's probably managing multiple accounts so that then say okay then let's do this if it, again, if it's appropriate to say, let's hire a sales assistant, start that individual, you're going to train, you're going to train this individual up, right, because you want to be a leader. Um, you have them start with the job order management component of it, working with the recruiters and getting the submittals in there, and then slowly integrate them into the account. And then we can, we can look at breaking you out into a new account and then build out a compensation plan where they're compensated, compensated for that individual's production as well as their new production. Those are some of the creative things that you can do. But again, it all, it all, every situation is unique and the key is to be, you know, is to be um, in front of it as much as possible. And at some point, you might be, it might be a situation that the, what the person wants, the company simply can't provide. And all you can do is, is pipeline for individuals uh, get them started, get them trained up, and get ready for the transition because it's eventually it's eventually going to happen. It just depends what that person wants and really what the what the company can provide. All right, great. One of the things that you mentioned um, is your best practice of in retaining people is to start with a strong company identity. And of course, yes. you know, as a marketer, that's sort of the same place we want to start. Um, mm -hmm. What do you see some of your clients doing to try to define that identity or do they have that identity when they start with you? So that's a great question. Some of them do. And I would say the, a company that has the strongest identity would, where it starts is knowing who your customers are and the willingness to say no to certain customers. Because honestly, everything is driven by the, by uh, most of, most, a lot of your culture is driven by the clients that you support. So first and foremost is to have a strong, strong sales strategy that's well-defined that you know who you are, you know what you're going to market as, then you know what kind of organization you need to build, then you know what kind of culture you need to order support it. You know, one of the things I always talk about is, you know, activity, you know, there are some organizations that, you know, are very activity driven and everything else, um, but if you're a quality driven organization and kind of quality is what, kind of what you hang your hat on, more so than anything else, 
culture drives quality. The, the, the nature of the culture within the organization really is what determines the service level that we're providing. That's why you have to understand who are the clients that you're supporting because that directly reflects the type of behavior you need internally, right? If you're going to be transactional, then that's the kind of company that you're going to have. If you're going to be more quality driven, it's going to be a very different culture. So it does all start with your sales strategy, knowing how you're going to market, knowing the companies that you provide that you provide services to, and then building a culture that really that really is aligned with that. Okay, oh, that's great. Um, and you, one of the sort of related thing is the the sales culture. Yeah. Very often in in a strongly sales dominated culture you can get the uh, I is greater than we as sort of the the salespeople view themselves at the top of the food chain in the organization but the organization wants to create a collaborative culture how do you create the alignment between top producers between multiple top producers and the top producers in the organization so when you have individual salespeople that are that are more, how can I say, more kind of inwardly focused, like they're saying it's really about me being great and not so much about the company. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've seen that where you have, you know, people who are top producers, but they believe the world revolves around sales, and in any staffing organization, the world is very cooperative. It revolves around sales, recruiting, operations, okay. all in harmony. Yes. And how do you create that alignment? Uh, I've also seen organizations where you know recruiters are hoarding resumes because they're all top producers, but they don't want to share. Right, right. You know, and that um, that's that's always something that's going to be a, that's going to be a, that's going to be a struggle. Um, I guess one of the best analogies that I have for this is um, the championship Chicago Bulls team that was able to absorb Dennis Rodman. Right, you can only have one Dennis Rodman on that team. If you had eight Dennis Rodmans on that team, it would be a train wreck. Okay, so you can have top producers that are very independent and be able to still manage around them as long as they're not highly destructive to the culture. There's, you know, but if you get if you get too many of them, then they start determining they they start determining the culture of the organization, and that and you can't allow that to happen. And and then this is going to sound harsh, but again. I mean, I've had to have this conversation. I had a top producer. She was fan. She was fantastic, but she was brutal. And you know, and I would have recruiters that would leave crying. I mean, it was really bad. Um, and I let her go. And you know what? We still grew. Hmm. So at some point, you have to have enough confidence in yourself to say, you know what? I the success and failure of this company is really up to man. Is really up to management leading this company and being able to make those difficult decisions. Because even though they, in a sense, they're making our jobs easier because we can always count on a certain amount of placements from them a month, you will not grow. Eventually, it's going to reach critical mass where the, the cultural destruction that individuals can provide outweighs their individual production. And, and that's something you have to come to terms with. And I think most managers know in their gut when it reaches that point. The problem is, is that we don't know, we don't have a backup plan, and we could hire the wrong person and everything else. But I'm telling you, I've had to do it personally. I've had to have other people do it, and you know what? It works out fine. Yeah, and so, a lot of you know, it, it, there's, it, there's, you go ahead. I was saying a lot of times people are afraid to pull that trigger because you're getting rid of someone who is, you know, very responsible for the success of the the business, but very destructive to the team. Right. But but that's why too. That's a great point, David. That's why too that being highly aware of the of the potential, your potential in top producers, the people that are currently on your team that you think you can get to that other level and accelerating their growth, is crucial because that's the only ammunition management has. The the reason why we're so hesitant a lot of times is because we don't have options. So. But that's on us. We have to proactively make those options available to us so we can mitigate that impact of turnover and still control the culture of the company. Great. Now, another question just came in. Uh, any thoughts on retaining talent from leaving the agency side to jump over to the corporate side? <laughs> um, that's a great question. And I have a personal bias on this <laughs> end. Um, and so just kind of take it for what it's worth here. Obviously, in a corp these corporate recruiting positions, um, you know, they can offer a higher salary, um, and you know, that's what a lot of people go for. So, the, the, you know, the first thing is is the compensation upside of how your compensation plans are developed. Do they have enough upside to really warrant the risk of working for an agency versus having a, a salary position 
um, at a, at a, in a corporate role. I mean, that's one of the things from a pragmatic uh, management standpoint that you would want to look at. And especially with top producers, the nice thing about variable plans is that you can have an accelerator you can accelerate their compensation um, when they hit certain gross margin thresholds and, the, and, and that person still remains incredibly profitable. So the good news is that you can always pay your top producers top dollar. The, the, the other side of the equation, however, is this. If, if that individual is leaving uh, because they really don't want to be paid on commission, they don't care about the upside, or they want to leave because they want they don't want to be they want to be part of a corporate environment. I hate to break it to you, but there's really not a lot you can do or should do. The corporate recruiters have a different mentality. Agency recruiters are almost, in a sense, entrepreneurial by nature. They want that upside. The risk doesn't bother them. If somebody goes to corporate recruiting, unless your compensation plan is fundamentally broken, that person's simply not a fit. It's just one of those things that is just a. Um, it's just one of those. It's just one of those things that you really, you really can't control. But the things that you can control, like I mentioned, is the compensation plan. Review it. See how it compares to the salaries that they're giving. Making sure that upside is strong. And, and that, that would probably, in terms of management, one of the active things you can do to, to, uh, to stop that bleeding. Great. And um, one last question here, Mike. Um, you work with a lot of staffing companies of all sizes, helping them to evaluate their businesses, improve operations. When it comes to this retention issue, uh, what are the most common mistakes you see? Uh, I, okay, great question. So the, common, the most common mistakes in terms of uh, and this is because of the kind of the work that I do. That's probably why I see it more. Is that you know one of the things that I do is you know roll out management governance and management metrics and things like that. And one of the most common things that people do is they have a metrics portfolio that they're measuring their people on, and they stop forgetting that they're managing people. They think they're managing numbers, right? And so they change the relationship with their individual producers. And they start saying, well, you didn't do hit this number, you didn't hit this number, and they become very narrow in terms of how they manage and how they communicate to the team. So one of the things is like when you change management systems um, and you start managing to metrics, you have to be smart about it. Man manage, uh, metrics are there to inform you. They're not to replace your judgment. They're there to inform your judgment. So that's one of the things I see managers, they have a difficult you know, transition, uh, transition making. Um, you know, the other things that really you know, drive turnover is when there's a failure in sales strategy um, and, 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 and the company is now, because they've grown on their current account base, have kind of lost the edge in terms of their business development and they lose their confidence. Um, in the end, um, staffing is a sales business and your, your health is based on how well you sell. Um, what happens to a lot of companies is they land some big accounts and they just lose that edge and eventually that catches that you know that catches up with them and then the other thing and believe it or not it growth drives this turnover and it sounds counterintuitive but it, it's very very true when an organization is small people have an intimate relationship with the executive they feel personally connected to the company's success through that personal connection of the executive as those people get marginalized as the company grows they get frustrated and they leave those are the most common things that I see Great. Well, um, I want to thank you very much. Uh, terrific insights today. Uh, I've, I took a lot of notes myself, and uh, if you happen to go on Twitter later, well, I, I muted myself so I could share your wisdom with the world. Lots of great comments. If you wouldn't mind advancing to the last slide, I'd like to also let everybody on today's call know that we have a Lunch with Haley webinar coming up. Our next one is going to be on July 23rd, and it is going to be Show and Tell, our 2015 review of all the latest and greatest marketing projects that we have been working on. You're going to see uh, lots of new websites, some new direct marketing, some really cool social stuff, and uh, some of the latest changes in email marketing. So I hope everybody on today's call will join us. And once again, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I hope we'll get an opportunity to have you back again on a future Lunch with Haley. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it.